Hey everybody, welcome to the Others Podcast. I am your host, Stephen Penny. Uh, we're slightly delayed from when I last spoke to you all. I think I said I'd be back in about a week. Had some minor surgery, took me a bit longer to recover than I thought it would, but we are back. But this week, we got a new guest. I like new guests as, as much as I like the returning guests. You're all great, but it's always good to have some fresh thoughts and ideas joining us on the podcast. So this week, all the way from Boston, and everyone seems to be on the East Coast for some reason. Right. We've got Xavier Jones. How you doing, man? I'm great, man. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. It's 2 a.m. I'm slightly tired, but <laughs> I think we're going to get through this. Nah, yeah, man. I appreciate you for uh, having me on here. Like I said, I'm a big fan. Love the show. Um, guys always dropping gems, so it's an honor, man. I'm, I'm just happy that you stayed up for it. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we got there eventually. We've been trying to schedule it for a little while. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But yeah, this week we're going to talk about, what's what I'll be talking about, hot and fun. Um, oh, no, actually, before that, before that, I've got some follow-up. I rarely do this because I rarely remember to take the notes and remember this, these sorts of things. But I think on the last um, episode, we were talking about sooner or later. And I talked about the guitar work on there and the guitar kind of solo towards the end. And I mentioned, I thought it was Brent playing it. Cause Brent's credited on the album with uh, guitar work. So I just assumed it was him. Uh, I did actually speak to him after and he politely corrected me and told me it is in fact Ray Ray playing the guitar. Uh, on that song and not him so a little bit of follow-up there no one else bothered to correct me but just in case anyone uh wanted that little bit of information there you go yeah dope dope so we've got hot and fun this week people that listen to the podcast will probably have heard me rant a little bit about this song in the past, I'm not the biggest fan of this song, so this could be interesting. I'll give you the, the basic information. This was uh, the first single from the album Nothing, released in, in May 2010. Uh, the video was directed by Jonas Ackerland, a Swedish guy. He was famous for doing uh, Madonna's Ray of Light, which he won a Grammy for and seven MTV Video Music Awards. He also did... Um, I noticed the Prodigy's Smack My Bitch Up video, which was kind of iconic and controversial at the time. And I thought I'd also mention it just because a few days ago, Keith Flint, frontman of the Prodigy, passed away as well. Um, but an amazing video that was. Uh, and he also directed, funnily enough, um, Swedish House Mafia's uh, One, which features vocals by Pharrell as well. Uh, in terms of how this song charted... Eh, not particularly well, unsurprisingly. Uh, in the US, it got to number 26 on the Hot Dance Club Songs chart. I have no idea what chart that is. 26. In the UK R&B chart, it hit 15. Belgium, uh, in the top 50, it got to number 23. 98 in the Canadian Hot 100. 88 in the Netherlands. Uh, oh, and in the UK, in fact, on the official chart single thing it got to 49 so it did not perform particularly well as a single yeah i'm not and i'm not really sure with the whole uh the u.s hot dance club uh (laughs) a record of top billboard hits are i know you always speak to the obscure u.s uh categories so that that's kind of kind of makes sense for this single (laughs) yeah it's the the hot dance club songs number 26 i've only hit 26 in that weird (laughs) Category, right. I don't imagine where it got on the main charts. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not really sure, but um, yeah. But with this uh, video, we've actually got a few different versions of this video. We're going to just talk about the main one, I guess. Um, but it's a few different versions of the video to go with different versions of the song. So the single was released. Um, I can't remember what the, the kind of B-side to it was, but there was also like an alternate EP, a remix EP that was released that had remixes from... Uh, the likes of Starfield, Boys Noise, and there were a few others on there. I think there were six or seven different remixes on the the additional EP that came out. Yeah. Uh, and that meant there were three other videos. So we've got the the main video that most people would have seen that we'll, we'll kind of talk about. There was an alternate version to that. 
There was the Boys Noise remix video and then the Starfield remix video as well. Uh, all of the other videos tended to use footage from live performances, so from festivals and uh, smaller kind of shows. Uh, but the main video, as mentioned, was directed by Jonas Ackerland and is a bit of a, a, a mixed bag. I actually quite like the video in itself i think there's lots of kind of interesting ideas and concepts mixed in there Mm -hmm. the song i'm not so keen on obviously we'll get to that but yeah from from the video perspective there's a little kind of tinge of mad max to it with some of the the outfits and out being out in the desert and stuff like that it's very 60s slash 70s influenced again in terms of some of the things that are being worn the colors that are used and i did also read somewhere in an interview i can't remember if it was pharrell or or the director talking about it but it was actually kind of quite influenced by uh the beatles yellow submarine and magical mystery tour videos and again that's kind of i think where you see some of the 60s and 70s influence We've also got some mild native Indian cultural appropriation going on in there as well, which is uh, always interesting to see in these slightly older videos where it was kind of okay to do these things and maybe wouldn't fly quite so much these days. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I picked up on those vibes too. Is it like a bohemian uh, themed, I guess? Is that the... Yeah. Some of the inspiration here? Yeah, definitely. And we've got a very kind of loose concept of the guys driving their Rolls Royce through the desert, picking up attractive female hitchhikers, and that kind of culminating in one big party around a bonfire at the end of the the video. So there's not much to it in that sense. There's no kind of real story to the the video in itself. Um, But like I said, there's, there's lots of little kind of parts to it that I... I quite like, especially the kind of art collaboration that they've done with uh, Friends With You, who are like an art collective. I think in some places it does say that the artwork was done by uh, Cause. Yeah. I know Cause has done artwork or has done a previous collaborations with Friends With You, but I don't know if this, this is actually Cause that has done this artwork on the, the Rolls Royce and... Also, some of the animation and lettering and stuff we see kind of throughout the video. If anyone out there does know if that was definitely cause or definitely wasn't, then please do get in touch. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure myself, but I did check out their website. And um, the the kind of piece that the, the whole car is wrapped in is called Magical Explosion. So it was a piece that they said was commissioned by NERD. And I'm not sure if Cause would have had something to do with it, but it's definitely kind of similar to his style. But uh, they use that kind of for uh, a lot of uh, promotional pieces and for a stage setup during uh, this kind of uh, initial tour for this album. So uh, if you look at some of the sets or even like uh, um, the car wrapped, those things, things of that nature, they definitely use the artwork quite a bit. And you could kind of see the animation throughout the video. So again, I'm not sure if that's something Cause had a hand in, but um, definitely was done by uh, Friends With You for sure. Yeah, because I was looking for kind of little little hints that, you know, Cause was involved. Um, yeah. And I couldn't really sort of see anything. Yeah. Um, it, it is kind of in that general style, but then I think if you look at a lot of the, the Friends With You stuff, it's they're kind of quite similar anyway yeah. in, in certain aspects. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested to, to know who actually was involved in, in designing this and creating a lot of this. So, yeah, if anyone out there has any definitive answers, then please do let us know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what do you think of the the video overall? Were there any parts that kind of stand out to you or uh, do you generally like it or generally dislike it? Yeah, man, I, I wasn't a big fan of this song originally. Um, the album is pretty good, though. It's a few songs that I love, but um, this song was never one of my favorites. Um, looking back at the video, though, I think uh, the highlight kind of was the car, the Rolls Royce being, <laughs> being wrapped in a sick pattern. Um, I think it was pretty cool that they did a custom kind of emblem on the front of the car as well with the NERD kind of a logo uh, going on. So for me, that was kind of the highlight, but um, pretty uh, basic concept in in video, (laughs) not much to it. Yeah, I'd concur with that. As I say, there's not much of a a story or a a narrative to it that you 
would sometimes expect to see in a video like this. But I think that kind of almost ties in with the the album as a whole. Um, I think the whole album end to end was it wasn't poor the whole way through, but it was probably the, the the weakest of all of their albums. And I think, as we've talked about on the podcast before, um, you know, uh, just over a year ago when they were at Complex Con, I think it was, you know, they talked about how they actually didn't like the album themselves, bar a few of the tracks on there, and how they weren't actually that keen on working on it. And I, I think, you know, there's, there's obviously some effort put into this video, but it, it certainly lacks in certain areas. Um, and I think that that's kind of representative of the album as a whole. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely agree with that um, about the album as a whole. Um, but um, yeah, video was super, super kind of basic. I mean, see some random uh, product placement like you you call out a lot. <laughs> you had the Beats by Dre in there. But uh, other than that, man, it wasn't much to it. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, this is probably one of the, this is, I think, the first video where we don't see any, uh, BBC branding, BBC or ice cream branding at all. There's no uh, clothing we see. We don't see any kind of uh, imagery or logos anywhere, which we would normally kind of see dotted around. We do literally see the the Beats by Dre um, on a few of the women kind of in the, the kind of band or group that they've got kind of playing towards the end of the video. But that's pretty much it. I'm not quite sure why that, that happened this video this is kind of 2010 so i don't think this uh is around the time where let's say things were going a bit south with bbc i think we're a little bit before that still at this point so um i'm not quite sure why we don't see any of it here maybe it just it may just be a kind of creative decision uh from the director or even from pharrell or they may have realized they're they were using it a lot in pretty much all of their previous videos, um, and especially with Pharrell appearing in a lot of other artists' videos as well. Maybe they just thought it was overkill, and they wanted to try something a bit different. I don't know. But yeah, no BBC, no ice cream, just the uh, the standard Beats by Dre product placement that we're, we're used to seeing in pretty much every music video around. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's funny too. Around this time is around when I first was starting college. So this was around the time when when you said like BBC went south. When I was able to get my first couple pieces because <laughs> <laughs> the price was so good. So I, I was spending my little my little college money and my odd job checks on uh, my first couple BBC tees and hoodies at the time. So uh, definitely um, right before that bubble kind of burst in the next year or two. Yeah, because I'm not quite sure when Iconics got involved in purchasing some of the company. Um, I want to say it was just after this, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to go and look it up. Or again, if someone out there can uh, look up the dates and, and remind me and tell me, that would be appreciated. But yeah, as soon as kind of Iconics got involved and wanted to, to have BBC in every department store on the planet, uh, I think that's when we started to see less and less of it from uh, Pharrell and everyone kind of around him. They started to kind of wash their hands of it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yep, I agree. I totally agree. And so in terms of this song, um, I think I've been quite vocal in the past in saying I really don't like this song. There's one main reason why I don't like this song, and that is the the, the special guest appearance of <laughs> of one Nelly Furtado. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that as well. <laughs> but I, I've got to say, so this I, I say that I don't like this song. It has some, the song has some really, really good elements. It's got that really kind of nice, funky bass line. Uh, some of the drums are really nice, especially the drums that you get just after the bridge. Um, the verses are average, let's say, but the hook and the bridge, I think, are really, really weak. And then having Nelly Furtado on there as well, doing a bridge just kind of kills it for me. Um, as people will know, I'm not a, a massive fan of her. I just, I, I find her very annoying, let's say. And even in this video, I've got to say, I just watched it back yeah. a couple of times yesterday and then a minute ago. Yeah. And she's kind of stood there with her arms crossed doing this weird finger clicking thing. And it just, 
infuriated me for some reason. Yeah, in the random cloud graphic, like she just pops up. It's like what? It's kind of how the song is too. Like it's just going smooth, and then Nelly Furtado hits. It's kind of the same in the video. Like they're having a good time in the desert, and then she just pops up in the clouds. <laughs> it's kind of yeah, I think there's one where she's in in the cloud, and one where she appears kind of in the fire as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. And it's <laughs> they obviously couldn't get her on set for those couple yeah, of days, so exactly. they've you know filmed her in a green screen somewhere and just told her to stand still and click her fingers yeah. and she does it with her arms crossed in a <laughs> in a really really weird way yeah no i agree with that <laughs> and it's uh, I, I guess this was kind of around the time when she was still uh, popular let's say she was still you know doing stuff with timberland and and people like that so i guess when you need an you know when you need somebody on a bridge or on a chorus or something and you kind of look around you look at who's kind of popular at that time or who's working with who and they've decided to pick her for that song for whatever reason but yeah i'm really not a fan and and i think that as i say i think the the hook in the bridge are really they're just weak anyway um <laughs> i'm assuming they were they were written by pharrell um and they're by no means his his best work yeah i agree with that it's definitely kind of weak um was this the like I know this was the lead single off of that album and um the cover art he's kind of wearing that same military hat with the feather do you know mm-hmm. kind of the story behind that or that was just his style at the at the moment or I don't um I know there was kind of a an overall military jacket hat type of phase he went through again I'm not sure if it's around this time or not all these timelines of different things end up confusing me yeah I, I think it was more tied into just this video and this the concept of this video again it's kind of a little bit mad max ish it's that kind of there's been some kind of apocalypse and they're just wearing a a, a mishmash of of whatever clothing they can throw together you know you've got shay in a in a top hat yeah. you've got chad in like a a helmet like a metal helmet so I, I think it was just to kind of tie into that concept more than anything, I'm assuming. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Um, on another note, though, back back to the Rolls Royce, which was the highlight. Um, you I, you mentioned earlier that it was kind of a homage to the uh, the Beatles Yellow Submarine kind of thing. And John Lennon actually also had a Rolls Royce that's kind of crazily painted as well. So, yeah, he has all the, the flower motifs yeah, yeah. and stuff, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. So that probably maybe played back to that whole idea and concept as well. But um, yeah, I didn't know about his, uh, his Rolls Royce, but I was like, that's pretty neat. <laughs> yeah. John Lennon was out there stunting in the sixties before yeah. any of these, uh, <laughs> right. these rappers were doing it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He, he's the godfather of swag. So that's... he was doing, doing all the drugs. Yeah. <laughs> painting up his Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, man. All right. What else have we got? Like I said, there's not, there's not an awful lot about this song to, to really talk about. Like I say, the, the nah, video man. doesn't doesn't really do much. The song is it's an average one. Like I said, it didn't it didn't perform very well. I remember vaguely remember hearing it in some clubs and stuff back then when it came out. And as I say, it's got that kind of bass line, which is actually uh, quite a nice bass line. It, it, I guess it's kind of a good bass line to kind of dance to or to, to kind of play in that kind of environment or that kind of setting. But bar that, it. It does nothing for me, really. I've got to say. No, I agree. It's it's stadium music, man. You gotta you gotta open up your mind. <laughs> <laughs> There's a nice reference back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, William, what you said? Well, you, you got it. After you. No, I was going to ask you about the album. You said you, you thought the album was weak. I, I like a few of those songs on the album, man. I, I like the album. Uh, well, that's the thing. There's I can listen to the album, and there's certainly um, a few really good tracks on there. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff where <laughs> yeah. you can tell their hearts weren't in it. You yeah, know? exactly. There's a lot of there's a lot of crap on there, to be honest. No. Well, not crap. I mean, that's a bit harsh. But but there's a lot of stuff, such as this song, that yeah. you know, you could tell they were just knocking it out because they kind of had to knock it out and they had to kind of fill up the album and they weren't really into it yeah no i 100 percent agree with that for sure because there's stuff like i can't remember the track listing now but you've got like life is a fish on there which i think is a, a really nice track 
Um, and I'm trying to think off the top of my head what else is on there. Yeah, so you've got like yeah party people on there. Oof. Yeah, yeah, that one wasn't that great. Hypnotize you, I actually really like. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, produced by Daft Punk, I actually quite like that. Help me, I kind of like. I think that maybe because I actually saw them perform it live before the album came out. I think it was their first time actually performing that song live. I got you. So that kind of uh, yeah reminds me of that. But yeah, then you've got the likes of Victory, Perfect Defect. Meh. I like Victory a lot, man. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that was. Uh, then I've seen the light, which I do like. Yeah, that's a good one. God bless us all. Meh. What man? You're 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 a harsh critic over there, man. That, those are a couple good ones. Was God bless us all? Was that the one? written for chris brown i'm not 100 percent sure uh who was written for it's the one uh keep your head little brother yeah yeah a little bit. yeah 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 so yeah they're, they're referring chris brown there after his oh after he beat, gotcha. the, after he beat the crap out of, of his girlfriend wow, i never which is probably why i'm not a fan of the song <laughs> just because yeah exactly. I, yeah i get you've got to like stick up for you know People in your community, people uh, in your industry, and all that kind of thing. But I got no time for the likes of people like Chris Brown. So, you know. Wow, that's crazy. I did not know that. That's a great context to the song, man. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, and no, I remember, like, I think Pharrell talked about it. Um, it was written with him in mind when obviously all the stuff with Rihanna happened and he was getting kind of. Um, kind of lambasted in the in the press and everything, and was getting lots of grief. But to be honest, good. Yeah, exactly. And we were talking about this on International Women's Day as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you <laughs> if, if you if you attack a woman and beat her to within an inch of her life, to be fair, I think you deserve a lot worse. So, yeah, I've got I've got no time for for that or a, a song referencing him to you know keep his head up and ugh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Uh, Life is a Fish, I like. Nothing on You, meh. And then Hot and Fun, meh. No, I agree. Yeah, those two I, I really didn't like, but let's see. And I'm just looking at the uh, the chart positions as well. Yeah, it didn't the album itself didn't chart brilliantly. It did a little bit better in the US, actually. US Billboard 200, it got to number 21. Got to number five on the US top R&B slash hip-hop albums. Uh, only hit number 83 in the UK album chart. It did get a number four in the French digital album chart. Yeah. In the normal album chart, it only got 43. Yeah. And then Belgium, some weird Belgian chart, it got to number three. But in their main chart album, it got to 56. So, yeah. The album itself didn't do well either. Uh, unsurprisingly, I think I have to say. Yeah, no, I agree too. I think for me, there's you know on the album there's one kind of standout track in terms of you know what would be a single and what you would expect from an album that's hypnotize you, which I think did a, did do a little bit better than this one. Yeah, for sure. I think I think we'll probably be talking about that in a couple of weeks. But bar that, yeah, you look through that list, and if I was their management, if I was their A and R or whatever, I'd have a hard time picking what should be the single off of that album and certainly what should be the lead single. Uh, they also went for Hot and Fun just because it's kind of a, yeah, like a par- party, yeah, like a party anthem kind of thing, but yeah, it, it, it's a weak one. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that for sure. It's funny that Pharrell was so uh, opposed to it. I, I watched that same uh, other tone thing from uh, Complex Con, and he was like, man, I hate that. So I was like, wow, because <laughs> going back and seeing all those other versions that were like the live performances, he seemed to be like really feeling it, but I guess that's the artistry and uh, in your craft, I guess, to really go out and wholeheartedly do your thing. But I was like, I found, <laughs> I found that kind of crazy <laughs> how much he disliked it. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird because I've seen a few of the like live performances when they were like kind of promoting the album, and in some of them, yeah, they get into them. I think a lot of it depends on the crowd, the crowd and yeah. who they're doing the performance for. Because I know there were a lot of a lot of sponsored performances at around that time as well, which I know Pharrell wasn't overly keen on. So yeah, there, there were a lot of kind of good performances, but I have seen a lot of kind of lackluster performances of a lot of those songs as well. Gotcha. I got you, and I uh, and I know as you say, yeah, Pharrell wasn't keen on it. I think Shay was even more vocal during that interview, uh, in terms of 
you know, how much he disliked being involved in it and recording it and having anything to do with it. Yeah, man. The verses were kind of weak, man. <laughs> Shay's verse was like, ah. <laughs> but yeah. No, it's good though. All right, so let's um let's give this our little rating and then we can we can move on. If you give me an out of 10 for the song and then for the video, what would you give me? I'll give you maybe a 3 out of 10 for the song and uh the the wrapped Rolls Royce was sick to me, so maybe a five, but that kind of saved <laughs> saved the video. But um, I mean, yeah, it was pretty rough, man. The, the, both the song and video weren't that that appealing to me. But um, yeah, I'll give it a, a three and a and a five. Yeah, I I'm close with you. I, I think I'd give the song a three. Yeah. As I say, there's there's some nice key elements to it, but it just they don't do anything with it. Yeah. And. I think Nelly Furtado takes off about five <laughs> points immediately. For the video, yeah, it, it's going to be like a three or or a four, I guess. Yeah. Again, like you said, it's, the car is nice. There's some interesting concepts in terms of the the artwork and stuff that they've got going on. Bar that, yeah, there's nothing else really to it, is there? Nah, man, nothing at all. It's super bare bone and I don't know. The party at the bonfire is kind of the highlight, which was, I don't know, kind of random. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I think this is our lowest scored song we've uh, we've talked about so far. <laughs> wow. Wow, right? I'm a part of history, man. I'm, I'm happy. And I, I, I've got a feeling it probably will remain that way for quite some time. <laughs> okay, cool. At least if I have anything to do with it, it will. Yeah, cool, man. I'm happy to be a part of it, man. Breaking history. All right, so let's get on to some other um, bits and pieces. Uh, we can do some pickups and some shout outs and then we can talk about some sneakers. Latest pickups. Yeah, man. I've I've normally got a bit of a list here, but this time I've got very little. I think I've got I'm looking around my office now. I've got one thing, I think. I've got I talked the other week about how I'm starting to buy some vinyl again and just kind of collect them well for the sake of collecting them really, because I don't even have a, a record here anymore or some decks. Um, but I picked up an original copy of uh, Frontin on vinyl. Yeah, that's dope. That's, yeah, it was like a, a, a nice little pick up. It will go, go up on the shelf. I think that's it. There's not been any sneakers. There's not been any BBC stuff since the last time, I don't think. But no, I think, I think that's kind of it. Anything from yourself? Anything you're kind of feeling at the moment? Yeah, man, not nothing too serious over here. I mean, we know you go hard, so it's good you got a little break. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I got My a bank account needs that break. <laughs> yeah, no, man, I just picked up a pair of boutiques, man. I got a pair of the Dice, which um, are cool. Not my favorite pair of uh, boutiques, but um, add them to the collection. So got a few pair now. Which colorway did you get? Um, the white, the white with the red dice. So okay, so I was looking for the black and green, but I mean the prices are. Uh, up there but i got those for a good price man i got them for like under 100 bucks so i was like yeah, i gotta grab that it. is good <laughs> yeah so yeah the uh, the king effect definitely uh kind of got me <laughs> these days. king effects never stops <laughs> yeah but, but that's uh, definitely a good price because i i know of people selling those dice ones at the moment not the black ones but yeah the white and red and the white and green for over 200 so if you've managed to get them for under a hundred, that's a that's a nice little steal. Yeah, yeah, clean, nice little pickup. Um, trying to get to complete my beepers pack. Looking for the black and red beepers, but I mean those are kind of kind of pricey. And once you get into size twelve or thirteen, where I'm at, it's really hard to find. So <laughs> gotta Oof. keep keep looking. But um, hopefully I'll get there. That's the problem. It's yeah, you know, I'm a, a a very average US size nine. So there are probably more of them made than anything. Absolutely. Which means there's kind of more out there. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to find sometimes. But yeah, when you start getting up to anything over 11, then it gets uh, really difficult. Man, it's hard out here. Yeah, your sample size, man, you, you could get any and exactly. every, <laughs> any and everything, yeah. you, dude. <laughs> that's dope. Distinctly average, but that that's good sometimes. Yep. No, it's a good problem to have, man. Size Niners. Guys are the are the true legends of the sneaker game. <laughs> and anything else? Anything else you've got recently? Nope, man. That's it for me, man. That's my only pickup. Like I said, just on the hunt for a couple more boutiques or board flips where I could get my hands on that I that I like. But um, that's it for me. Uh, the last week or so. Nice. Yeah. So if anyone out there has some uh, any board flips or boutiques in monster sizes, then, then hit <laughs> up this man. Yeah, please let me know, man. We can work it out. I got you. What shout outs have we got this week? I think I've got, again, I'm awful and I've probably said I'll shout people out and I probably won't because I'll forget. But I've got one this week. 
and that is previous guest and friend of the podcast, uh, Doughboy Meets World. His new album is out. No, his new album you can pre-order, I think, and it comes out soon. His new album, Flamingo. I recommend you guys go and get that. You can drop him a message. He's currently doing um, like a little gift bag thing. I think it's like $30 maybe. And for that, you get a copy of the album... You get an email with an exclusive track. You get some pins. You get a T-shirt, some stickers, uh, just a bunch of bits and pieces. So if you want to support some other people in the community uh, that are making music and doing what they love, then definitely go and hit him up. Order your album and your goodie bag now. I think the album's due out maybe next week or the week after, perhaps. But don't quote me on that. I'm sure he'll correct me. But I'll put some links in the show notes for people. But great music, great guy. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to support, definitely go out there and cop that as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I got to check that out. Definitely uh, let me get the link to that. But I, I've been seeing you posting it here and there. So I definitely want, need to check that out and go and support myself. So it's dope. Yeah, his, uh, his previous tracks have been really good. Um, as I say, he's been on the podcast before. He certainly knows his stuff when it comes to uh, the Neptunes and NERD. And a lot of his music is very Neptunes-inspired as well. You can definitely hear some of those sounds in there. So, yeah, really worth checking out if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. And, again, it's one of us in the community. Um, and we've all got to kind of support each other out here as well. So For sure. For sure. Any shout outs you've got? Anything you want to mention? Um, no, man. Shout out to you, man. Star Trek World, all the guys who are on the show, man. David, all the dudes who are, who are, who are repping out here and, and putting us up on game. Um, I will say, though, you guys you guys did have uh, Ice Cream Day Part 2 should be coming up <laughs> April 11th. I don't know if you guys remember that, but uh, we're waiting for that next episode to drop. But yeah, other than that, man, just shout out to everyone that's uh, you know, that's, that's in the community and the show, man, for uh, showing love and support for NERD and and ice cream and all that stuff. So it's an honor to be on the show and just appreciative of all you guys uh, contributing. So thank you for sure. And yeah, I have to mention, I think Dave has posted something about it recently. Um, obviously, you're probably all following him at King of Creams. He's currently doing his, I think, top thirty ice cream countdown. I think he's at about. 25 or 24 or something and i think he did also post something about the national ice cream day that he proclaimed to be some kind of national <laughs> holiday last year and i'm sure he'll he'll do it again this year as well so yeah we're we're in march now aren't we so yeah start uh start digging out your ice creams start working out what you're gonna wear how you're gonna wear them and then i'm sure we'll be sort of sharing those pictures next month when when that comes around yep Yep, absolutely. Getting ready, man. All right. So, yeah, one other kind of topic we, we touch on sometimes on this podcast, but I, I wanted to talk about it the last kind of couple of shows and haven't really had the chance. And then you're on here and you are directly linked to the sneaker industry. Yeah. And this is about specific sneakers. So I thought he's the perfect man to, uh, to discuss this with. Yeah, for sure. And that is the flooding of the market of all things Hugh. Mm. This is kind of a, a... I've been chatting to Dave about this kind of on and off recently as well. And we have kind of very mixed feelings, I think, about some of this. When the, the kind of Hughes first came out, so I think we had the NMD ones that came out first. This was, I don't know, what was it? A, two years ago or something? Yeah. Maybe even more than that now? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they were really, really original. They looked great. They were really sought after. They were put out in fairly limited quantities as well and they were reselling for silly money and even the original kind of few packs still are reselling for for silly money at times yeah i see them kind of crop up quite regularly and they still command you know way more than the uh the retail price Mm -hmm. but as time has kind of progressed obviously adidas have kind of seen this popularity and I think as with any kind of commercial product that is selling well and has a lot of hype around it, especially when it's owned by a a huge kind of corporation like Adidas, they've decided to kind of roll out more and more variants uh, with a faster pace of release and, you know, more quantities of them as well. So everyone can kind of get their hands on them, which 
to be honest, is fair enough. I'm while I love the kind of limited edition stuff, when it comes to really cool sneakers, you know, I want everybody that wants to try and get a pair to be able to get a pair. I don't want people having to queue up overnight or at stupid o'clock in the morning or sit there like me with, you know, five different devices refreshing pages and sitting in those fucking stupid waiting rooms that Adidas kind of puts you in while it tries to work out if you're a, a bot or not. Yeah. Yeah, I want everyone to be able to get a pair. But the problem we've got to now, I'm seeing, is at least with the, especially the NMDs, because of the higher price point, is even the more limited ones, so like the BBC ones recently, Mm -hmm. they're just not selling. Yeah. They're like, they're they're getting left over in the stores. We saw the last pack with the, they weren't part of the, no, they were, yeah, they're like part of the Solar Hue pack with the the four different kind of colorways. They were originally called the Africa pack. Yeah. And it was a solar hue pack, I think they were called. You know, we've seen them discounted to less than half price at retailers. And now, you know, even Adidas, I think, on their web store kind of dropped the price on them for for a while as, as well, around sort of December time. And at that point, with these, there's a couple of pairs I really liked. But at kind of, for me, 280 euros over here, so about $250. Yeah. I was like, nah, I'm out. Yeah. But then when they come up at half price, well, of course I copped a couple of pairs. Yeah. But this is this weird kind of position we seem to be in now where they're still trying to push this kind of silhouette and this brand, but they're pushing so many that the hype is wearing off. And are we going to get that hype back for them? Or are we now just forever going to see NMD Hughes sat in shop windows for you know, six months. Well, yeah, well, with me, man, I think it's a couple things. I think maybe this whole hype for a uh, sneaker bubble may have been finally, like, died out. I mean, since maybe 2010, 2011, we've definitely kind of seen uh, a resurgence of kind of interest into footwear at high levels, kind of starting with Jordan originally. And then, you know, with Ye- Yeezy kind of going over to Ad- Adidas and kind of figuring that whole thing out, he be- kind of became the face of hype. And then, you know, you had to, under the Adidas banner, you kind of had Pharrell and Pusha T and all these other artists and these kind of key collaborations kind of pushing the uh, overall narrative for that brand and then driving hype to those key kind of limited products and then trickling down to the inline range. Uh, and then you've seen shoes like NMD, the, the first NMD become like a cult classic almost for Adidas, which is kind of the first in many, many years. So um, maybe we're seeing uh, kind of the, 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 the kind of uh, direction kind of shift back to, uh, you know, pure kind of collectors like um, ourselves or people that are interested in the artists or, or collecting the footwear instead of kind of this mass thing who kind of has a bigger umbrella for all these consumers. Also, you're kind of seeing a lot of more interest in high fashion footwear, the Balenciagas and the, the Givenchy's and Gucci, all these different brands are kind of pushing their own narratives and these kind of high end running silhouettes. So maybe they're taking a share of the market space as well. But yeah, it's really, um, really, really weird to see this stuff sitting because you couldn't find it at all, <laughs> like especially the uh, the first few uh, NMD drops. So maybe that's it, and it could be potentially they are just raising the uh, increasing the the amount of volume they're doing. I mean, we've seen that with Yeezy, for instance, too, where you can you can see, get those shoes two to three days after the drop, and I mean, you used to sit on your phone, your your laptop, all this stuff trying to get a pair, and you, and you couldn't get them. So. They could have a deal where both of those artists may have uh, additional incentives or or a higher volume um, increase um, during the duration of their contract. So not really sure what it is, but um, I think we're seeing it from pretty much every brand that a lot of footwear is sitting. And uh, maybe that kind of whole hype bubble is kind of burst a little bit when it comes to footwear. Maybe. Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I mean, we're seeing it from Nike to uh, Adidas and a, a lot of other brands. So it's kind of a. Uh, Kind of, kind of curious to kind of see how everything's kind of shifting. So maybe we'll go back to uh, the old days now where the real collectors are kind of grab what they want. I mean, you'll still have those fringe consumers, but maybe mania has finally died out a little bit. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's just weird. It's, you know, you, you look at companies like Adidas and they have, yeah, they will have these kind of marketing plans, marketing strategies, production strategies. Yeah. You know, two, three, four, five, even more years down the line. You know, they, they kind of know what's, coming and they kind of know what they're going to release when they're going to release it probably roughly what kind of quantities it just seems to have been a strange kind of decision that they've made it's did they get it just get it wrong and misjudge things did they think the 
the hype would last longer than it did. Absolutely. Or did they just did they just kind of screw up and you know flood the market and? I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think they definitely probably thought the hype would last a little bit longer. I mean, if you look post twenty fourteen with Boost and how that became this whole phenomenon when prior with energy boost the first couple um shoes in the first ultra boost you could find those things regularly at retailers and then boost kind of caught on post 2014 2015 i mean and everything boost was pretty much flying off the shelves at that point and we've definitely seen that slow down from uh from all aspects even with the ultra boost so maybe maybe that is it and like you said we're you're always on a on a on a year and a half to two year calendar at the earliest so you, you got to think this was set in motion i mean in 2017 and that was literally peak kind of boost fever at the time. So uh, maybe it was just overproducing. I, I'm not really sure, but um, it's definitely kind of a weird space in, in footwear right now because everyone's trying to kind of uh, counteract what's happening uh, in the industry. And like I said, from all brands, it's 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 no real like uh, product or, or asset that's really kind of killing it. I, I mean, aside maybe from Yeezy, and we've seen a slowdown in product from him as well. Um, as far as selling out and and definitely those uh, numbers are or not numbers, but uh, um, the 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 uh, the the um, what's it the resale value definitely plummet over the last six to twelve months. So um, yeah, maybe it's I, I'm not really sure what's driving all of that at the moment. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, like the Yeezys there again. Like over here, over here in Finland, we get like really limited stock of the Yeezys, the, yeah. the NMDs, all these kinds of things. Yeah. And the two stores here that have uh, the Adidas contracts to to do Yeezys, they always do raffles. Yeah. And normally what will happen is they'll do the raffle. You have to go in store to do it. People will queue to go do the raffle a lot, a lot of the time. They then have to come in. Obviously, if you win the raffle, you then come and pick your shoe up on a certain day. And that's it. And normally, you know, back in the day, I say back in the day, it's a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of years back, that would be it. You do the raffle, people would come and get them no matter what, they'd all be gone. You'd then see all of them being resold at ridiculous prices. But now what we're seeing even here in a really small kind of market, which is, and this you know is hipster central here, it's, you know, the kids love all the uh, Yeezy stuff and things like that, all the hype stuff over here. We're seeing there isn't as much uptake on the raffle and then there's a lot more people that do not come and collect them when they do win the raffle. So previously, you would hardly ever see a store say, okay, raffle's over, we've still got, you know, we've got one or two pairs left in store, you might see. Now it's, okay, raffle's over, actually, we've got this size, this size, this size, this size, this size, and this size in store because people didn't come and collect them, people didn't want them or whatever, because they're either not cool or they know they're not going to get the resale value on them or, you know, whatever it is there, they would normally get them. Yeah, yeah, that, and then I think kind of the the surges of kind of these kind of resale kind of uh, platforms like Goat and StockX and all these companies, because now they're setting the value for you. So it's no longer like you know we think it's at this price point. I'm gonna you know try my luck on an eBay or or whatever where I sell my sneakers. Now it's like they're literally using like StockX and Goat as like an almanac for pricing. So if they're getting you know a thousand pairs that day, they're gonna set the bar you know a little bit lower. So like why would I spend you know three hundred dollars on a pair of Yeezys when I know I'm only getting, you know, you know, three uh, maybe maybe break even at this point. So it's kinda like I think a lot of those kind of consumers that weren't really into the product are kind of backing out because they're they're realizing they're not getting a bigger return on their investment uh by flipping shoes. So that's also been a big uh big thing. I, I've definitely seen that a lot where guys are like you go to stock X and before it was like you would go to eBay, see the last few sold, you know, kind of, you know, throw out prices and now it's like these guys are kind of setting the bar for what things are going to be. So Maybe that's an issue too for these guys. I guess if I can't get a bigger return, well, I'll just I'll just wait it out then. Yeah, I think yeah, resellers are kind of lose. Well, not that I want resellers to kind of win, but obviously they're not buying them because they can't get that value. But then also, you know, people like myself that just generally have an interest in sneakers and collect them, I'm put off buying them just because of the the sheer number. Yeah, uh, you know, being kind of pumped out in the price point. So as I say. Over here, I paid 280 euros for a, a pair of the Hue NMDs. If they're releasing four of those at a go and they're releasing them, um, we've seen recently, you know, in two month spaces, you know, you get four pairs come out, two to three months later, you get another four pairs come out. It's just, it makes it unobtainable because just, you know, I, you can't pay a thousand euros for, 
you know every pair of shoes every couple of months like well in, in theory you can but like i know my girlfriend would beat me with a frying pan yeah. if i you know if yeah. i did that every couple of months yeah. no, it definitely it's seems, just not seems, it's just not feasible yeah it seems less special too like if you think again like prior it was like you got three to four colorways you know and that would last you the whole year and then you they maybe take two years off before you get another another rendition of that or a completely new silhouette so it's like now I think everything's so fast. I think also with social media too, consumers, well not con- all consumers, but a lot of the younger guys are just trying to consume, consume, consume. So the brands are like, well, let's just keep pumping a new newness, you know, every other, every other week, it seems like, you know, with uh, Nike and, and, Ida, and Adidas, you know, it's always a new product or a new hue. You know, so it's pretty uh, crazy to kind of see that, but, um, yeah, man, I'm not really sure. It's an interesting time for sure, man, in the in the sneaker industry. And I can kind of see a lot of people kind of mentioned to me about the the tennis shoes because I think I've got about I don't know, 20, 25 pairs of them now. Yeah. Some stupid number. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> but the the tennis shoes I can kind of understand a little bit more because I know when they were first coming out, I spoke to somebody who was kind of affiliated with Adidas, and you know they were telling me that. This is actually a, a, a really long-term plan from Adidas. They want to make the tennis shoe a standard silhouette. You know, they want to make it like, you think of Adidas, you think of a, a Stan Smith, a shell toe, and you know, a tennis shoe is in there as well. You always think of a tennis shoe when you think of Adidas. Or if someone says a tennis shoe, you know what it is. You know what that shape looks like. So I can kind of see why they do it. Uh, again, there's a lot of bloody colours in terms of the um, the tennis shoes, but they there's more purpose behind the amount that they're pumping out because they really want to appeal to every single person they possibly can, every demographic, every age, every location, everything. And like I say, you know, I own a stupid amount of them in most of the colorways. I think you know, I just got my kid a pair of the kids only colorway as well that they've they've put out um you've got the women's only colorways you've got european exclusives you've got jd sports exclusive ones and all sorts but again i can kind of see that from a marketing perspective if you're really trying to make it a a staple of the kind of overall brand and again the price point uh what are they about 100 dollars, 120 euros i think i pay it's not too obscene for a shoe like that, and you know they are mad comfy as well. I do love them, but yeah, when we start talking about the the NMDs and we talk about that price point and kind of what's driving all of that, it's um it's very strange. Yeah, my question to you though, which I kind of argue with marketing quite a bit, uh, with you know usually with those guys on things like, I don't know if you can make a a shoe a standard kind of like you know if you look at like a Stan Smith or Air Force One, those kind of thing without sport. Like, I feel like those things were so heavily rooted in, like, the highest level of sport that it kind of transcended mm-hmm. generation. I feel like, you know, we're still – this is fairly new. Like, we we haven't seen uh, basically artist collaboration kind of last, you know, more than 10-plus years. I guess Pharrell and Ice Cream, BBC, a little bit. That's kind of one of the earlier stages or Reebok with S. Dot Carter. But um, post that, I mean, every shoe up until that point was kind of, you know, an athlete – kind of pushing that agenda whether that was jordan or air force one or even a stan smith so i wonder if entertainers can have that longevity with a silhouette that would last you know the kind of stand of time you know and also like those shoes were around you know 30 you know 40 years and you go back to it i don't know if you'll do that with an nmd um a a hue nmd or or you know i'm not sure a tennis hue um i'm not 100 percent sure but pharrell will be around i think he he's a legend but i'm just not really sure if um if if they have that cachet in in footwear like athletes do, I think that's what they're trying to sort of bank on. I think that's the kind of shifting sands of the of kind of popular culture. Yeah, I think obviously you know a sports star still holds um, massive weight when it comes to a shoe of some kind. Absolutely, yeah. But we are seeing you know celebrities, let's say whether they're artists, musicians, whatever with the the kind of the generations now with you know social media and all these kinds of things you're seeing it kind of shift slightly you know back in the day shoes held such weight or sorry uh, sports stars held such weight in terms of the shoes they were promoting because you didn't have social media so you would go to games you would see them wear them Absolutely. you would see the picture in the newspaper you would see the high, the sports highlights on TV and you'd see them wearing them Whereas now, because we have the likes of Instagram and Facebook, you can see any celebrity wearing anything, you know, a hundred times a day, basically. 
and it's that I think they're trying to bank on. They're trying to use that to kind of not force it down people's throats, but to to kind of get it in people's faces, basically. Yeah, do, do, does a music artist hold as much weight as a sports star when it comes to a sneaker? Uh, I think probably to us that are slightly older, maybe not. But I think to other people, it probably does. And again, you, you mentioned about the kind of sports connection. That makes me think, is this why they've specifically branded the tennis hue as the tennis hue to give it that kind of sports a sports reference a sports link in some kind of way not that you've got tennis players promoting that shoe at all not that i I don't think you've got any sports stars out there promoting uh any of the hue stuff really in terms of being able to wear it when you're playing sports i guess you have the byw x kind of stuff so you got the basketball stuff yeah yeah but yeah no, that's a good point. I guess I didn't look at it through uh, the modern generation. I'm always looking at myself. I'm like, I'm the old guy now. <laughs> but it's like, um, yeah, maybe maybe they, they 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 look at artists a little differently. But also their attention spans a lot shorter. When you're like, yeah, like I had to wait for the next East Bay or or you know magazine to see the next Jordan and things of that na- that nature. And now it's just you know I'm flooded with every celebrity's feed and every brand and you know what they're wearing at the time and it's different from what they're going to wear tonight. And that's the thing. If you go, yeah, if you go back. 20 25 years to when or at least when i was sort of a teenager and i would subscribe to yeah sports magazines and hip-hop magazines and stuff like that yeah because you only got those once a week or once a month when you got them and you flicked through the pages you actually paid attention to what people were wearing you know what what adverts were actually in there now we're all so kind of bombarded with adverts from Instagram, Facebook, every website we visit, we're tracked everywhere. You, you, know, you have banner blindness, basically, where you kind of a modern thing where you kind of you know, block out ads psychologically when you look at web pages now because you just see them everywhere constantly. It's it's very different, and while it gives kind of people that do marketing more opportunities to get this stuff in front of different people, it also leads to this kind of not backlash, but you know, you, you kind of become used to it and yeah. you you kind of glaze over and you skim past it and you don't look at these things in as much detail now. Yeah, it makes it less special per se. Because you know you're mm. gonna get something else the next day or a new new feed from another brand or new product. So I don't know, man. That's a that's an interesting point. I we should definitely uh dive into looking into that or the analytics behind that. But um I find that's a very interesting take even like you said like the, the the i mean the shoes i'm still buying were shoes i wanted when i was a kid so it's like and the resale value is still high i'm still having to spend over 200 dollars for a product that came out in 2004 or 2005 which is insane where i don't know if that'll be the case for a lot of stuff you know over the last you know six to seven years and and then the, the numbers and are, are so rapidly higher as well so i'm not sure man i mean I know Kanye has been been trying to get Yeezy to be that that standalone brand, and I don't know if he'll make it, man. It's starting to slow down. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but um, hopefully they'll figure it out. But I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence. I'm always like, dude, performance. Like, I mean, I feel Pharrell and and Kanye could both do a lot in terms of performance for Adidas. I mean, of course, it has to be like technically sound and has to work functionally. But I think that aesthetic or even their their name lending itself to that, I think, could be a a cool thing um going forward i think they have to look at performance personally but that's maybe my uh my old manness um mm-hmm. I, I like sneakers but yeah yeah interesting to see sort of how these things progress over the the next kind of few years and how they you know how the market changes and how the the brands kind of actually adapt to that because i think the last few years or maybe the last five years or so it has been you know there's been this kind of explosion of kind of sneak culture and collecting and, and as you say maybe that it's maybe not burst but maybe it's starting to yeah. plateau a little bit it's starting to even itself out a little bit and yeah you know the people that went hard five ten years ago now aren't doing that and you know you have a younger generation who can't always nece- necessarily afford to pay yeah you know 250 280 300 for for a pair of shoes especially when there are four being released at a time and they're every two or three months yeah no i agree yeah it's it's different like it's it's funny like uh 
Like when I ask some of the younger kids that are at work now, you know, they're like 22. I'm 27, but they're like, yeah, man, the greatest shoe of all time is like acronym Presto. I'm like, but what about the Presto? <laughs> like, where did that go <laughs> in the mix of things? But they like, man, the hype, the collab is where it's at. For for me, it was kind of that general release version. I had to get in that book to order or see online or at Finish Line or Foot Locker or a JD Sport, wherever it may have been, kind of resonated with me a little bit more where these guys are like hype, hype. Like what collab is it? Who Who's doing it? You know, what artist is it? is it with so it's definitely a different kind of perspective at looking at product but um yeah we'll see where it goes man it's a it's definitely uh like i said an interesting moment right now someone's gonna kind of probably uh escape from the whole pack and kind of start a new uh a new little movement in the next you know year or two i i assume but who knows yeah we'll have to see uh see what happens but yeah if uh anyone out there has any thoughts or opinions on this then please do free to feel free to drop us a message on Instagram or head over to the website and you can add a comment there directly on the, the post for, for this episode. All right, well, I think we've, we've hit about an hour. Yeah, yeah. We've got some good conversation in there. So I think it's, and it is 10 past three in the morning here. Yeah. So <laughs> I, think, I think it's maybe time to start wrapping things up. Absolutely, man. You need to get some rest, man. <laughs> yeah, sure. but thank God it's the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we'll leave it there then. So as I just mentioned, if you want the the episode, if you want to stream it, if you want the show notes, if you want to go leave a comment, you can head over to the website, which is theothers.net, obviously others with a Z. You can find uh, Instagram and Facebook and all that at Others Podcast. You can find me at Steve R. Penny. And where can people find you? Yeah, man, I'm on Instagram, just Xavier Jones uh, underscore XCI. Yeah, just hit me up, man. Um, like I said, big fan of the show and uh, the community and everything that's going on. So, yeah, feel free to to reach out and hit me up or check out what I'm doing. I don't post a whole lot, but just try to try to do a little bit more posting here and there. But, yeah, come check me out. Good stuff. All right, well, that's it for this week, everyone. Thank you for listening, and we'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Peace. Uh-huh.